All right, it's top of the hour, 2 o'clock. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Supporting Children Who Lose Parents to Accidental Overdose. My name is Jessica Samuel, and I'm the project coordinator at IRETA. I will be moderating this webinar today. At this time, I would like to go over some housekeeping items for today's webinar. We would like to encourage you to participate in today's webinar. If you have questions for our presenters or are experiencing any technical issues, please use either the chat box or the questions pane to communicate your questions to us. At the end of the presentation, Eric and Cindy will stop and allow time for questions. At that time, I will read aloud any questions that have been submitted. Again, you can submit questions using the chat box or questions pane. Throughout the webinar, all participants will be on mute. Following the webinar, you'll receive an evaluation with a, an email with a link to the evaluation and information on how to access your certificate of attendance and CEUs. This webinar has been approved for 1.5 NADAC and PCB credits. Certificates may take up to 48 hours to appear in your My IRETA profile, so we ask for your patience. At this time, we're going to go through two poll questions. Uh, we'd like to get a picture of the demographics of those in attendance today. There are no wrong answers. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put these questions on the screen, if you give me one second. And it's going to be an interactive poll. So please select the best answer as it applies to you. And I'll give you a couple minutes to make your selections. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll now. So you'll see the first question is, what is your um, current professional role? And the second question is, what field do you represent? Um, and if if you don't feel, if you don't fit into any of these categories, you can also chat us. Um, it's not necessary, but you know we just like to see who joins our webinar so that we know in the future what type of topics to present according to who's joining us. Everybody has about 15 seconds to submit your response if you haven't done so yet. And um, then I'm going to go ahead and show the results so everybody can see who's on. So we can see today that we do have um, quite a few people that are counselors, therapists, social workers, and case managers. Um, and then we do have some university faculty and program or unit managers. And for the field, it looks like the top ones that people are in here are mental health and addiction. Um, so thank you guys so much for participating in the poll. We really appreciate it. Um, we will be recording this webinar, and at this time, we've begun the recording. I would now like to introduce our presenters for today, Eric Halsey and Cynthia Grindle. Eric Halsey leads behavioral health analytics at the Allegheny County Department of Human Services, 
and will describe the results of analysis about estimating prevalence of childhood bereavement resulting in unexpected, unexpected loss due to parental overdose and encounters with public systems. Cynthia Grindle is an account manager at Life Solutions EAP. She'll discuss the ways that helping professionals like mental health counselors, child welfare specialists, and school personnel can support children who have lost parents to overdose. And at this time, we're going to begin the webinar, Supporting Children Who Lose Parents to Accidental Overdose. On today's webinar, you're going to learn about the background on overdose and child bereavement. You're going to, we're going to review the Children Left Behind analysis from Allegheny County, PA. You're going to learn how to support children and families. And at the end, we're going to have time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to you, Eric. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, happy to be sharing this information with you today and um, start with a little background on the topic. If you go to the next slide. So I present on the overdose topic very often, and I always start with this image from the New York Times, uh, which is a little outdated now from a couple of years ago going through 2014, but I think it makes a really good case and leaves uh, the audience with an impression of how drastically this phenomenon and this epidemic has changed over the course of 10, 15 years. Uh, in the country. Um, in 2017, CDC had estimated 72,000 deaths due to drug overdose in the United States. Most of those uh, contributed uh, as a result of opioids. And uh, I think depending where you are in the country, um, the, uh, the, the synthetic opioids, as we've heard, fentanyl and carfentanyl in some places around the country, as well as their analogs, or different compounds of them that are even more potent uh, have increasingly been involved in these overdose deaths. And that's more than the number of U.S. military casualties in uh, the Vietnam War uh, for the entire uh, 10 or so years of the, that conflict. Um, let me go to the next slide. And so the main reason for why we're discussing this today and why we initiated um, at least our analysis to take a look at this is, you know, why is it an important topic? Um, having done overdose prevention work for over 10, 12 years now, um, many of the prevention efforts uh, rightfully have been attempted uh, to address individual and community level risks of uh, fatal overdose. Um, but, you know, in the national narrative, this overdose epidemic is also affecting families. These people uh, are connected to families in some shape or form. Um, uh, there's unique risks for children at different ages uh, who experience an unexpected death and particularly uh, resulting from uh, overdose. I'll share with you some information about other ca unexpected causes such as suicide, um, and homicides, but today's presentation will focus on uh, overdose. And then finally, substance misuse within the household has been identified as one of the adverse childhood experiences which uh, predict uh, ill health uh, effects of a variety of uh, effects uh, later on in life. Uh, and so, we think this is an important topic, wanted to take a look at that and then put together this presentation, uh, Cindy and I, to, to communicate this to you. Okay, next slide. So as I mentioned, efforts rightfully have been focused on preventing fatal overdose. This report um, or data brief, for a brief from the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, it highlights some evidence-based strategies for preventing overdose throughout the country. And I, we, you know, I'm listing these highlights here for you. Um, and these are all very good interventions if your aim is to reduce fatal overdoses or the risk of fatal overdose 
many of which we, along with our colleagues in the health department and other community stakeholders, are performing in uh, Allegheny County, which we're in southwest Pennsylvania if you're not from the region, um, and, and Pittsburgh would be the, the center of that city of Pittsburgh. Um, but uh, these don't really address, uh, you know, we want to change the narrative because it's been, we've been so focused on individuals who choose to use drugs and their risks of overdose, uh, there hasn't been much attention on the family, save for uh, the discussion about grandparents' parenting. So if we can lead us to our next slide. Um, and this has been one area where we uh, have had some attention, but what's, why it's also important as these deaths are occurring, if you see here on the top right, this chart um, that is also from the CDC, uh, presenting age-adjusted drug overdose death rates. If you look at the ages that are affected, the top age category, and this would vary, this is for the United States, but your region, just as ours, might have a different, uh, uh, a different age group that is the, the experiencing the highest rates, but 45 to 54 nationally, followed by 35 to 44, followed by 25 to 34. So not only are these the child-bearing years, these are the child-rearing years um, where we're losing quite a number of people around the country. Um, and Congress had passed uh, the Supporting Grandparents and Raising Grandchildren Act that really had addressed this. And in that bill, they had cited a few pretty notable uh, statistics. Um, and I've listed a few here that more than two and a half million grandparents in the U.S. are the primary care and take care of their grandchildren. Um, and for a, a seven year period between 2009 and 16, uh, that substance use was a contributing factor for children's out of home placement, rising from 25 to 37 uh, percent. And then the number of foster children placed with a grandparent or other relative increasing from 24% in 2006 to 32% in 2016. And we'll be able to present to you some of these uh, uh, perspectives locally from what we did in our analysis of the actual children we believe were affected by this. Um, and I think that uh, at this point, I will turn that over to my colleague to present to you um, a little bit on the impact of loss. Cindy? Jess, is Cindy unmuted? Jess? Jess, uh, is this Cindy? Yes. Yeah, I, okay, I, well, go, go ahead. I think you were needed to get unmuted. Okay, thank you. Well, sorry about that. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, one of the primary reasons for exploring this topic today is that the death of a parent can have a significant impact on children. Uh, when a parent or other significant caregiver dies, it can really send a family into crisis. Uh, the surviving caregivers might be overwhelmed emotionally and less able to provide support, and the normal routines of family life are disrupted, so leaving less time and energy to address children's needs. Uh, and we know that some families have difficulty talking about death with children, or they believe that they should protect children from the pain of grief, and we'll talk more about those specific issues a little later. Uh, but as a result, when we take a look at children who've lost a parent or a significant caregiver as compared to their peers, studies find that uh, an increased risk for depression, anxiety, social withdrawal, suicidal ideation, and other problems. And if we look at the next slide, 
there are also risks that have been associated specifically with sudden or unexpected loss, and those include complicated grief, which is when certain factors cause the acute phase of grief to be more prolonged, more persistent, or disabling. Um, and also another risk is childhood traumatic grief, which can happen when a death is perceived as traumatic and the symptoms that occur interfere with the child's ability to adapt to the loss. Uh, the Burden of Bereavement Study, which was a seven-year longitudinal study that investigated the impact of sudden parental death on children, found that there was an increased incidence of depression in the early course of treatment, primarily in the first two years after the death, and there was also an increased risk of PTSD and functional impairment. Uh, however, the study also found that early identification and treatment can reduce the long-term impact. And that brings us to why we are here today. So, Eric, I'll turn that back over to you. Okay, so let's present to you a little bit about what we found um, um, in terms of how many children in our community, in our county, had been affected. Uh, and and where we saw them uh, at some time following the parent's death. So the next slide. So the purpose, yeah, so as identifying the prevalence, and as I mentioned, we also included uh, not only overdose, but homicide and suicide in our analysis. So I'll include a couple of slides that show this in comparison, um, and I can point you to some place uh, where uh, in the near future you could actually read our report if you're interested. Um, and like I said, I want to describe the human service and other public system encounters of this group of children uh, so that, as uh, Sydney was just mentioning, we would understand where uh, throughout our uh, uh, public systems we might be able to identify um, where we can provide mental health support and other social service needs, uh, meet these needs of children who are presenting at these systems around our community. And I included a little uh, chart here that shows you the past 10 or so years of drug overdose deaths in our county. Um, you know, as you, you see there, um, the orange line is presenting the opioid-related, the blue line is pre presenting all drugs. As you can see, most of them have been opioid-related. But starting around 2014, uh, you know, 200 or so a year is still pretty high but we start getting close to about 300 around uh, 13 and 14, all the way up to 674 drug overdose deaths in 2017. Uh, and much of this was explained in our region from fentanyl and its analogs. So uh, throughout this period, a lot of uh, these individuals had been parents. And so what we did, next slide, we have a, uh, a data warehouse, and if you're uh, not doing this stuff uh, often, uh, just to describe simply, this is a place where we integrate lots of different kinds of data, um, birth certificates and medical examiner autopsy reports, which will be most relevant for uh, the present analysis, but all of child welfare, some of the court, uh, family court and criminal court, uh, the county jail, all kinds of uh, public system and service records, we integrate at the individual level and we do that uh, routinely, um, uh, sometimes weekly, and, but every month we refresh this information. And what that allows us to do is get a 360 perspective from all these different systems an individual might encounter uh, living in the county. So what we did is we used the autopsy records to identify a cohort of individuals who had died of a drug overdose, homicides and suicides as well, um, between around 2003 to 2017. We then identified a number of birth certificate records back to 1999 through 2017 on which these individuals had been listed as a parent. And then we summarized those available records and they're going to present those to you. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so the the adults. Um, what we found is that there were 666, 664 uh, adults who had died of an overdose. Now, there are many more who had died of overdoses, but these were the ones we could identify who had been listed on a birth certificate. 59% um, were fathers, 49% were mothers. Uh, as you can see in our county, different from those national statistics, the larger percentage, and I can assure you those it's the larger rates, um, the 25 to 34 and 35 to 44 year olds. Um, and 74% were uh, between 25 and 44 years old. What's notable about this as well is different from the actual demographics of our uh, overdose cohort, the individuals who die of overdose in our county, um, in this sample, not surprisingly, they're overrepresented as uh, females. Um, in 2015, uh, there, we, we really had about, uh, I would say, we're probably double the size. I, there's not as many, there's not 41% of females who are dying of overdose uh, in our county. So in this record set, females are a little bit overrepresented, but there's always a mother listed on a birth certificate and not always a father. So that also explains uh, some of the, the differences here as well. So of these 664, um, how many children were affected? So there's 1,948 children who were affected by either a, a parent's overdose, homicide, or suicide during this period. 1,008 of them, so half, uh, was resulting from overdose death. Uh, and you can see that in the table on the top there. Uh, to the left, the number of children by age and cause of death. Uh, for overdose, you could see that many of them are, uh, the, the, the highest frequency are between five and nine years old, followed by 10 to 14, under five, and then 15 to 18. But 61% of those children um, were under 10. So in terms of thinking about interventions, this gives you a sense about the prevalence uh, by age. And children are affected differently by age, and I think Cindy will have something to say uh, to that uh, in terms of how might you respond or support those children. But compared to homicide, for example, the ages are, are, are slightly different, um, but we won't have a detailed discussion about that today, but we're gonna flesh that out a little bit more in our report. Um, the percent of children, um, you know, as I said, so about uh, almost, yes, 61% or so uh, under 10, but then you could see the proportion of the children uh, who are a little bit uh, older uh, age. Okay, uh, next slide. Yeah, so now I wanna give you a perspective on the public system experiences, human services uh, uh, that, the, that, that these children experience following the parent's overdose death in the months and years following that. Next slide. So family court, when looking at these court records, um, I should say what we should turn our attention to first is on the bottom, you know, these adults, uh, we counted deaths uh, from 2003 through 2017. So for those adults um, who died in 2016 and 17, for example, we don't really, we're not really able to um, observe the children following a year from them because we're, we're not yet there. You know, December 17, we're not even in December 18 yet. So for the time periods, for some, for one year, for two years and five years particularly, you'll notice on the right there that only 715 and then 231 for five years uh, of the thousand were we able to observe uh, children for the full period. That said, if we look at the chart here, about 7% of children were involved in the court for dependency reasons, uh, meaning that there was a child safety risk or a risk of neglect. Um, uh, for the adults at the time of the parent's death, 
about 7% of this cohort um, was involved at that time uh, in the, the family court. Into the future, it increases slightly and then up to about a year, at which point following a year, uh, you get a decreasing, uh, a, a decrease in proportion of the children. Um, fortunately, but still a, a little over 1% of the children um, were involved for delinquency reasons, meaning that they had uh, been engaged in delinquent behavior, basically being presenting before the family uh, court. Uh, where you see after two years, um, and it, of course it is only 231 children we're observing, uh, that goes up to 2%, so it, there's a slight increase there. It might just be the children we're able to observe, but nevertheless, something to uh, uh, be aware about. Okay, next slide. Child welfare, so if we think about the family court and reasons for dependency, uh, you know, we have the Office of Children, Youth, and Families. Each of your communities might call it something different, but they basically are responsible for ensuring uh, child safety uh, and basically the welfare, so safety and neglect of children uh, and intervening uh, to mitigate those risks. Here, there was 11% at the time of the parents' overdose death, 11% had been involved in a family court. That increases slightly over, you know, one month and then six months out, that does decrease following the year as well. Um, but as I cited um, from the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Act, um, the number of children of out-of-home placement, about 3% of these children at the time of the parent's death were placed out of home, increasing in the months following the parent's death. So we can kind of see what's happening in the family, the disruption in the family, and the ability to properly care for these children uh, is, is certainly one thing these children are experiencing. Uh, and the next slide. Publicly funded mental health treatment. As we might expect uh, through the bereavement process and this recent study, of the burden of bereavement uh, in the two years, especially following the parent's death, um, are involved in our mental health system. And what publicly funded means is either those uh, children who were uninsured, which are very few, um, and the county pays for them, otherwise, which the majority are, Medicaid funded. So that's what this represents. So the actual community rate of these children who might have had private insurance with uh, the adults who had died or their primary caregivers at the time, this would be the minimum uh, proportion of these children. So 9% had been involved in mental health services at the time of the parent's death, up to 11% six months later. And again, while it's only 231 we're observing, there's clearly a doubling of the rate. There's a, some clearly an increase but we're observing a doubling uh, of the uh, proportion of children who are involved in mental health treatment. Now, this could just represent an assessment. It could represent inpatient residential treatment, but um, we're not looking at that level of detail here, but it does tell us that these children are involved in mental health treatment. Okay, and now I'll turn it over to uh, Cindy to tell you how we can support these children and families. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be sharing just a little bit of information about supporting children and families. And um, it really starts when we're learning how to effectively support grieving children and families, it really starts with an awareness of our own thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes about death, about how children grieve, and also about addiction. Uh, in, in the article, Understanding Grief and Loss in Children by Jody Fiorini and Jody Mullen, they suggest that we still live in a culture that is death phobic. And our own reluctance to confront these issues hampers our ability to support, to be supportive. Uh, 
So start by thinking about your own comfort level in discussing these issues in general, but particularly with children. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be nervous at times or that you will always know what to say. It doesn't mean that you have to be completely comfortable with every aspect of death. Uh, but when we can demonstrate a willingness to talk about something that's difficult in a calm, open, and honest way, then it sends a message to those who are grieving that they don't have to hide their grief or pain and that it's okay for them to be where they are at that moment. So you can ask yourself things like, you know, can you say the word died instead of using euphemisms like passed away? Or can you be present with children who are expressing the pain of grief without trying to say or do something immediately to make them feel better or move them away from their grief. And that can be hard. Um, listening to anyone's pain can be difficult, but particularly with children, we have this natural desire to shield or protect. So we might find ourselves kind of instinctively saying, don't cry or be strong or don't think about that anymore. But the death of a parent is the loss of a connection that really needs to be mourned. To give you an example, uh, years ago I worked in a hospital and was part of a trauma team and there was a car accident where uh, the mother who was driving was killed but the young child who was sitting in the back seat survived and was hospitalized. And you know, the family was gathering around the bedside and of course this child began to cry that he wanted his mommy. And the aunt, who was the mother's sister, kind of lovingly bent down and said, I'm your mommy now. And in that moment, I could honestly understand the pain of that woman and the deep love, the deep desire she had to protect this child from the pain of grief. But I could also understand the pain and confusion of that child who, even though he was young, seemed to know that it wasn't as simple as that. And I know that's a fairly dramatic example, but the point is that we need to pay attention to the ways in which we try to comfort or help that really aren't very helpful. And instead, choose, as Alan Wolfelt says, to companion children in grief, which really means to walk with them, to walk beside them through it, acknowledging the reality, giving them permission to grieve, and then helping them to find ways to cope. And the good news is that you, to do this, you don't need to be a grief expert. Anyone in any setting can develop their ability to support grieving children. All it takes is a willingness to be open to the conversation, an awareness, as we're mentioning, of your own reactions, and a basic understanding of the grief process and the ways children may present in grief. Um, uh, there are some grief resources uh, listed on uh, some slides near the end and also I believe are available on a document that you, you'll have access to. Uh, so there are lots of good resources for educating yourself about just some of the basic understandings that we're talking about. And if we can go to the next slide, uh, if you're working with children whose parent or loved one died from a drug overdose, it's also helpful to know some of the issues that have been associated with this particular type of death. And so some of those are listed here. Um, according to Alan Wolfelt, grief is hard no matter what the cause of death, but there are some complicating factors with overdose death. So we'll go over a few of those. Um, first, the stigma. The stigma associated with substance abuse and with addiction can socially isolate a family even prior to the death. Friends, neighbors, sometimes even family members start to withdraw or keep their distance. And then when a person dies, or the family might receive less sympathy and support than would otherwise be provided if someone had died from a different cause. Um, so that stigma and that social isolation can then lead to disenfranchised grief. Uh, 
And disenfranchised grief is a term coined by Kenneth Doka. Some of you may be familiar with it. It refers to grief that is not fully recognized, understood, or validated. So, for example, when there's a lack of understanding about addiction, people might say, that, well, he should have known better, or you should have seen this coming, as if saying you don't have a right to grieve. Or sometimes people fail to recognize the significance of a relationship even when it's been difficult. So people might say, you know, that child's not going to miss her mother. She was never around. Or they might say of the family, you know, he was just a burden to you anyway. And again, you can hear in those statements the minimizing of grief. Uh, another example would be a child whose grief is disenfranchised because it's overlooked simply because of age. Some people think that a child too young to understand death is too young to grieve. Um, and with any of these scenarios, a child, a family can be left feeling alone in their grief. Stigma also can create a lingering sense of shame or embarrassment or thoughts of, or feelings that the parent died doing something wrong. And shame makes it more difficult for children to express or process their grief openly. Uh, and anger, Ang anger is a fairly common grief response, but especially with deaths that are sudden, unexpected, or out of order. Eric mentioned earlier some of the statistics about the age of, of the folks who are dying of drug overdose. And so it's not an age when we typically anticipate or expect people to die. Um, and so anger can appear in a lot of different ways in children, at the parent for using drugs, for dying and abandoning them. Uh, they may have anger at other adults, including caregivers, but possibly treatment staff or medical personnel, anyone that they think should have maybe done more to prevent the death. Um, they can have anger at God or at life for being unfair. And, and I want to make a note that, you know, anger is another emotion that kind of instinctively we want to shut down right away. But instead, it's important to help kids find constructive ways of expressing it. Uh, and then there's guilt. Children can exhibit something called magical thinking in grief, which is believing that the death was caused by something they said or did. So, for example, a child might say, maybe he died because I was bad or because I said I wanted him out of my life. And guilt can also be expressed as all those would have, should have, could have. Uh, for example, I shouldn't have gone to school that day or this wouldn't have happened if I, you know, fill in the blank. Um, and I'll share some strategies for uh, dealing with guilt a little later. Uh, but finally, there's the possibility of traumatic grief. In, in uh, supporting children with traumatic grief by Cohen and Manorino, they uh, provide examples of factors that can lead to traumatic grief. And some of those do apply to parental death by overdose, uh, including if the child didn't expect the parent to die, if the child witnessed the death or any suffering that was involved, and if the child saw or even just heard gory or graphic details about the death, those can all potentially lead to traumatic grief. Um, so social isolation, disenfranchised grief, the possibility of traumatic grief are just some of the reasons why early identification and intervention is important. And if we turn to the next slide, uh, we'll see some other reasons. Um, first, adult caregivers face a multitude of challenges after a sudden loss that can distract them from the needs of children. Um, and unexpected death can be emotionally overwhelming, but they, as we mentioned before, they can really also leave a family in crisis legally, financially, or in other ways. There are so many things that need to be dealt with, especially when a death was unexpected or unplanned. Um, custody issues, inability to access funds, uh, sometimes even the simplest of things like not knowing passwords uh, to get into accounts or those kinds of things. And on top of all that, 
uh, caregivers could be struggling with the additional roles or responsibilities that result from the parent's death. Um, in some cases, the child or other family members may already suffer from depression, anxiety, or mental health issues, or have, as we mentioned earlier, those uh, other adverse childhood experiences which increase their risk for either complicated grief or a range of other problems. And finally, studies have shown that early support and intervention can reduce the risk of some long-term impairment. So having said that, what can we do to support these children? Uh, well, the next slide shows a list. Uh, that this list is drawn from uh, Cohen and Manorino's work. It's not all inclusive. There are a lot of other things that can be offered. But I thought I would just pull together some things that, um, since we have a broad audience today, could really be sort of adapted to any setting that you might be involved in. Uh, so the first one is educating children about death, about grief, and even about addiction. When, when children understand what's normal or what's to be expected in grief, they can learn how to manage it. Um, and again, the resources that have been listed have a lot of great materials that are easy to access and adapted to different age levels. So I really would encourage you to explore those. Uh, but I'll mention just a few. Um, the, the Center for Loss and Life Transition has something called My Grief Rights. You can get it in a wallet card or a poster or flyers, which really kind of educates children about what's normal in grief and what they have a right to experience. Um, the Dougie Center has all kinds of resources aimed at children, uh, but also for parents, teachers, and communities. Um, the Aluna Network, which was formerly the Moyer Foundation, has information not only about grief, but also um, some really great tools for talking to children about addiction. Um, and, and there are some other uh, on other websites as well that are listed. Um, the other thing, one of the other things you can do in terms of education is making sure your school or your local community libraries or even other organizations in the community have materials uh, about grief for children. Um, and uh, so the second one then is supporting emotional expression. Uh, Mr. Rogers, or Fred Rogers, once said that anything that's human is mentionable, and anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. When we can talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting, and less scary. So instead of negating a child's feelings by saying, you know, don't be angry, don't cry, uh, create a safe space where they feel free to express themselves without judgment. Another thing you can do is encourage children to name their feelings. You know, grief is more than just sadness. So I feel sad, I feel angry, I feel scared, I feel lonely. And then explore with them what they can do to take care of themselves when those feelings arise. Um, Fiorini and Mullen also kind of suggest that one of the things that we often do is, um, is, is not address secondary losses. So, so we can help children process the primary loss, which is the loss of that person, you know, who died, what I will miss or not miss. Uh, but secondary losses are things like uh, the loss of a sense of security or safety in the world. Um, so kids might say things like, who will take care of me, or is someone else I know going to die? So those are all sorts of secondary losses that they say are also important um, to explore. Uh, another way you can support emotional expression is to help children identify who are the caring people I can go to when I'm feeling sad or angry. Um, who can I trust to be there for me? And that's at home, at school, or anywhere else in the community. Um, and that's informal resources, but that could also include uh, formal resources, uh, mental health professionals, uh, grief support groups, camps, other places where kids can go to find a sense of community in their grief. And, and some of the websites that we've listed uh, are uh, can be helpful in finding some of those types of programs in your community. 
Uh, third is teaching cognitive coping skills, which um, as you may know, you know, is helping children learn how to challenge or reframe negative or inaccurate thoughts. So this is where you can explore some of those thoughts that lead to guilt, shame, fear, or regret. For example, if, if a child is, say, feeling embarrassed that their parent died doing something wrong, um, then that would be an opportunity to really talk to the child about addiction or stigma and educate them about the nature of the disease. Uh, the next one is preserving positive memories. Uh, this is important any time a parent dies, no matter what the cause, but I think especially when it's been a traumatic or a stigmatized death that holds painful or difficult memories. Um, and, and I want to clarify, this doesn't mean that you need to gloss over or negate those aspects of the death, but you can help the child remember positive things about their parent or the relationship apart from the addiction or the way the parent died. Um, so for example, kids might create a memory box to keep personal items or other reminders of their parent or they can go through photo albums or videos, and of course that's when they feel ready. That's something that sometimes is hard to do initially, but at some point uh, might be helpful. Uh, I know the hospice that I used to work for had children pick out perhaps a favorite clothing uh, of uh, their loved one, and uh, the volunteers would make teddy bears as kind of a keepsake or something to keep something a positive memory. Um, and, and you can also help preserve memories by sharing your own stories, depending upon your relationship with the family and, and the person who died. But, uh, you know, family members can say things like, um, I remember when your dad held you for the first time, how happy he was. Or, or if you're a teacher or someone who works in the school, you might say, I remember when your mom came into parent-teacher conference and talked about how proud she was of you. Or you can even encourage, you know, the children to share their own favorite stories or, or memories, positive memories. Uh, the next thing is preparing for grief triggers. So. The process of grief is not like a lot of other things that we recover from. It's, it's, it's not a steady upward climb where each day gets a little better and a little better. If you had to graph grief, I think it would look more like the stock market. So along the way, there are going to be dates, times, activities, or even events that will trigger painful memories or a surge of grief. And we have opportunities to help both children and their families plan for how they want to handle those times. Um, Cheryl Sandberg offers some really good examples of preparing for triggers in her book, Option B, if you've ever read it, and if not, it's listed on the resources. But she writes about sitting down with her children after her husband died and creating a plan to what they called respect our feelings. And so they talked about what the kids could do at school when they got upset or they needed to cry. So, and they talked about that as a family together. And then they talked to the school so that they all had a plan where it's possible that the child could be excused and go to talk to the school counselor. Or maybe they would be able to take a walk outside with a trusted person um, on staff. Uh, Another example that they, she used was that they brainstormed options for the father-daughter dance. Um, and, and that's an important thing to be able to talk about. What does the child want to do or not do and, and involve them in some of the decision making. And then the last one that's listed there is building stress, and man, stress management and resilience skills. Um, this could be anything really that helps reduce stress or anxiety. So, so breathing exercises, mindfulness, um, progressive muscle relaxation, uh, talking about taking care of our bodies by exercising or getting enough sleep. Um, and, and Sandberg in, in option B also shares some core characteristics of resilience that we can um, help promote in children. One of them is, 
believing that they matter as human beings. So especially in times of crisis or following a death, um, making sure that children know that they are loved, that there are people that care for them, um, and, uh, and really re repeating that often. Um, also finding their strengths. You know, again, in the midst of crisis, um, everything seems so dismal. And so sometimes she, she gives an example in the book of a child, not her own child, but another child in a school setting uh, who was really going through a very difficult time. And, and one teacher took the time to get to know the child a little bit more and encouraged him to learn a musical instrument. And he goes on then to, to share his experience of that, which is how much, how important that was to him, that it gave him kind of a sense that he, um, there was something good about him and could be something good about his life, that it's what helped him get through some dark times. Um, so finding strengths in children and helping them discover those is important. Um, but children don't always have the words or know how to express them, their grief verbally. So if we go to the next slide, there are some sort of creative approaches. Um, these are some that Fiorini and Mullen have found to be effective, and, and those include art therapy, uh, again, which could be a lot of different things, making a collage, uh, decorating a picture frame, and then choosing a favorite picture that they want to put in there. Um, drawing can can be helpful, especially with chil children who are less verbal, but really with anyone. I believe the Aluna Network has a draw it out activity book for children that are um, age six or older. Um, there's narrative therapy, uh, which could be creative writing. Um, for older kids, it could be writing poetry or journaling. Um, it could be writing a letter, having the child write a letter to the parent who died, or writing a letter to loss, or writing a letter to addiction to kind of express what they're thinking and feeling. Um, and for those of you who, ha who have any love of music, you know that music and lyrics can often give voice to the thoughts and feelings that we can't otherwise express. Um, and they can also, music can also offer hope and inspiration. Um, so children could make a playlist of songs that help me cope, songs that pick me up when I'm feeling low, song that, songs that help me express when I'm feeling bad, or e even songs that remind me of my mom or dad. Um, and, and that last one kind of ties in with the commemorating the person who died. Um, so honoring and remembering, you know, a lot of, a lot of times people um, who don't understand grief think that talking too much about the person or continuing to do things in their name might be morbid, but it's, it's actually the opposite, that honoring and remembering are part of the process of grief. Um, so you can help children find personally meaningful ways to remember their parent. And, and that could be things like, you know, ceremonial or ritual kinds of things, a balloon release, planting flowers or, or planting a tree, lighting candles. But it could also just be anything. It could be as simple as sharing stories and continuing to talk about the person. It could be uh, visiting, you know, some of, doing some of the things that you enjoy doing with that parent when you feel ready to do that. Uh, as ways of honoring or continuing to remember. Uh, and if we go to the last slide, I, I'd like to kind of share with you before I end my portion of this, um, some thoughts on the subject of closure. Uh, closure is a word that, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's used more and more these days following death. And um, some examples would be, you know, when you see a public tragedy in the news, uh, within a day or two, you can maybe sometimes see newscasters saying, uh, this memorial service will give people closure. Um, and, and that's understandable, but grief is an ongoing process uh, that changes or evolves over time with support and adequate coping skills. But 
but grief is not a book that we sort of read and we flip through pages until we finally reach that last page that says the end and then we close the book and put it away on the shelf never to be revisited. Um, and especially when children experience the death of a parent, there will be reminders and new challenges to work through at various points throughout their lives, school activities, uh, parent-teacher conferences, proms, graduations, weddings, um, all kinds of experiences where, where each time those things happen, uh, the child or even now the adult can re-experience the loss. So uh, in her book, Closure, The Rush to End Grief and What It Costs Us, uh, Nancy Burns says that some people seek closure in grief, but many don't. And what that word means can be different for each person. So this comes back to where I kind of started this discussion, which is self-awareness, which is being careful about the language we use and the expectations that we have for those who are grieving. Um, and Burns offers some suggestions for what she calls navigating the rhetoric of closure, and, and, and I'll talk about the, the three that are listed there. Uh, first is redefining the relationship. Uh, so the word closure can often imply letting go or, or certainly putting an end to something. Uh, but if you think about it, a child's connection to their parent doesn't end with death. A, a child's connection to their parent continues beyond death. So redefining the relationship is sort of moving from a relationship of presence to a relationship in absence. And that can take many different forms. Um, some of the things we've already talked about, doing things to honor or to remember the person, in other words, keeping memories alive. Um, but it could be helping the child identify other things um, that they've received in some way from the parent uh, that they can carry with them and, uh, and hold on to. It could be a life lesson that was shared or a piece of advice or it could even be a certain characteristic of the parent, um, that they were always cheerful or that they always helped others, you know, something that is meaningful to that child that that child wants to carry on in, into their life. And the second one that Burns mentions is discovering your own path. And this is just simply remembering that there is not one right way to grieve, and there is no timetable that every person or certainly every child um, it applies to. Uh, so when we use the word closure, it, it can often sound as if what we're really saying is that a person isn't doing it right or certainly isn't doing it fast enough. Um, so instead, our goal really should be to support children in finding their own way, their, their own path, and what works for them. What works for one child or one person does not work for another. Um, and certainly then what works from them, for them in their own time frame. And the last one that is mentioned there is carrying grief and joy together. Um, and Burns says that you don't have to close or end pain, put an end to pain or grief in order to move forward. Uh, joy and sorrow are not mutually exclusive. So we can teach children that it's okay to cry, but we can also teach them that it's also okay to laugh and have fun even when you're grieving. So instead of getting over grief, it's really about helping children adapt and learn to live with grief. And, and by live with grief, I mean live, you know, form new relationships, uh, pursue their dreams or goals, enjoy what they have in life, um, but still knowing that they will grieve, that while acknowledging that this loss will always be a part of their lives. Um, so I know that we have uh, some, some slides on resources, um, but Jess, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you now um, to go from here. Thank you so much. Um, 
My colleague Layla has been monitoring, monitoring the questions as they've come in. Um, Layla, do you want to go ahead and ask the questions that have come in? Sounds like a plan, Jeff. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Great. All right. Um, I'm, I apologize if these end up being a little out of order, um, but I will make sure that everybody's questions get heard. Uh, so our first question today is a simple one. Uh, Cindy, this is for you. Uh, someone asked about the title of an article referenced in one of your slides. Uh, she didn't say which slide specifically, but that the slide source said Fiorini and Mullen. Yes, uh, that is listed on the references uh, slide, but let me go back and see. I, I believe it's uh, called Understanding Grief and Loss in Children, and it is uh, listed on, on the references that are listed on, uh, not the resources, but if you keep going a little further. Uh, yep. Yeah, right here, like the, the fourth one down, Understanding Grief and Loss in Children. Yeah, Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, just so everybody knows, um, we are going to be sending, Cindy created a really, really nice document um, of all of the resources. So whenever we post the recording of the webinar, we're going to make sure that that document is also there so people are able to access it, and then you'll also be able to access a PDF version of the slides. Um, so just so everybody knows, you'll get this information. You don't need to write anything down right now. We're definitely going to send it around to everybody. Thank you, Jess. A um, couple more questions coming in, and people feel free to continue to post these. Um, one of our participants asked um, about the physical developments of a grieving child, which could manifest as stuttering, bedwetting, self-harm, risky behaviors, et cetera. Yeah, so, so what are the, some of the physical uh, symptoms? And, and so, some of those, it sounds like you already listed, um, but certainly I would include, um, you know, especially so, sometimes school staff are going to be uh, some of the first, um, outside of the family, some of the first to notice um, some signs that uh, a child may be struggling uh, with grief. Um, but it doesn't always it's, it, it doesn't always differentiate itself from some other things that you will see in children. So you know, frequently going to the nurse or or headaches, um, certainly changes in sleep or appetite uh, could be other other physical characteristics that you would want to pay attention to. Um, if, if if that answers your question, and and you know, in terms of school staff, you know, you don't always have to know it. Sometimes it's hard to know why a child is behaving in a certain way. Is, is this outburst, or or are these physical symptoms, or whatever it is, um, the result of of grief, or a result of other things? And and I think in response to that, I, I would just kind of say that um, you don't need to necessarily figure that all out by yourself. That that's where you can. Um, include parents or the caregivers in the discussion, possibly, you know, uh, schedule a time with the school counselor or, or make referrals out, outside of the school in order for someone to, to more fully assess the situation. Thank you for sharing that information, Cindy. Um, our next question is for Eric. Um, this goes back to the very beginning of the webinar. Uh, someone was curious about this, and I have to say I was too. They asked, any insights on why uh, the steep apparent decrease in drug overdose deaths within the last year in Allegheny County? I know we're not at the end of the year yet, but so far it is looking like a lower amount. Right, um, and that is a... Uh, it, it's an obvious, and I obviously just blew right over that obvious, uh, you know, change. Um, through September, yeah, it's slide 11, I believe. Yeah, so, um, 
I'll just keep talking while you're navigating to it. Um, the uh, the reason for that, it does take quite a while for um, an autopsy to be completed. Usually our annual count in the county, uh, and we have all of our laboratory, tox laboratory and everything uh, at, at the county level, different from other jurisdictions that need to send it out either to a lab elsewhere within the state or outside of the state to perform toxicology analysis on uh, the, you know, um, hair, blood, urine samples that, that they, you know, to look at what was uh, in the person's body. We can do that here, but with the increase of fentanyl and analogs, these different substances, um, they can take longer to perform the autopsy. Usually our annual count of overdose deaths doesn't, isn't finalized until the spring of the following year. Um, but that said, I have done a quarter by quarter analysis and we are down um, starting from uh, uh, earlier this year, we have, re we really have the monthly sort of in quarterly perspective, it's been down. Some of the theories include uh, a positive that we have distributed so much naloxone um, which is the antidote to an overdose. Um, you know, many police departments are carrying it. All kinds of EMS agencies may, may be leaving kits behind. We've flooded different communities with this, um, giving them out to all of our treatment, substance use treatment, and even mental health treatment facilities. So we'd like to think that that has made a difference, although it's very hard to measure. Uh, another interpretation, which is a darker one, but we, we haven't validated it one way or another, but that, um, a lot of the cohort that maybe originally was exposed to prescription opioids and then converted uh, to uh, street drugs like heroin, um, many have died out. Um, some of the demographics are changing in uh, the recent years, and so I, I think there's some evidence for that, which is pretty sad to think. Um, and there could be, there's a lot of historical drug policy and uh, drug history research that would, would suggest that there may be people turning away to different substances and that kind of a thing. Uh, another is that people are adapting to understanding uh, high risk use uh, so that many people know that most of the stamp bags in the community have fentanyl in it. So they're either using differently or their tolerance is uh, accommodated to some degree, this higher potency. Uh, 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 street heroin. So I think all of those have some validity, but there isn't one real answer. I mean, certainly the heroin supply is pretty, pretty, pretty good still in our region. Hope that answers it. Uh, gives you some some insight. Layla, are there other questions? Uh, Layla, you're you're sort of you might be uh, echoing. We don't. I don't really hear you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Are you there, Layla? Yes, yeah, there are a couple more questions. Okay. I think this one's going to be for Cindy. Layla, this is Cindy. I, I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing you. Same here. It's echoing. I think it might be uh, maybe far away from the mic or something. 
Cindy. I actually see one here um, asking for an elaboration on the need for educators to have place within the classroom to support a grief experience. Could, could you speak to that at all? Um, sure. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, um, a school is, is a place children spend a lot of time at schools. Um, you'll often be some of the first to, to notice something. But I, I think it, in terms of it, uh, supporting kids in grief in schools, um, it, it can be anything. If you think about on any given day in any classroom or any school setting, uh, there are going to be children n not just who have had a parent die or a parent die of, of drug overdose, but who have experienced grief or loss in, in any number of ways. It could be the death of a pet. It could be the death of a grandparent. It, it could be loss associated with parents, you know, separation or divorce, or having moved from uh, one neighborhood or school district to another. So I think that there are ways of uh, supporting children who are grieving in general that will include anyone in any of those categories. And uh, one of those would just be um, talking about um, times whenever times whenever we feel sad. I'll give you an example. Um, I was recently, un unfortunately, uh, we've been at the Employee Assistance Program here in Pittsburgh um, being responding to um, a lot of folks who are struggling, adults and children who are struggling since the, the shooting here at the synagogue a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so I had the opportunity to be in a school district the, that following week. And one of the teachers there, uh, I thought, really did a nice job of um, starting her classroom just by kind of saying, um, I'm, I'm wondering what feelings uh, you're all ha holding in your hearts today. And, you know, the response was really interesting. It, it, it was uh, a couple of days before Halloween, so some kids were excited because Halloween was coming. Um, but a number of kids said they were sad, and, and not necessarily. Some were had been aware of what had happened and been talking about that. Others were sad for other reasons. Um, so she just kind of used that as a way of starting a conversation about, you know, how, what can we do when we're feeling sad? And uh, offering that, uh, offering coping skills, you know, some of the things that we've talked about is just kind of helping kids, guide kids through um, what are some of the things that we can do when we're feeling sad. Um, so I thought that was a really nice way of doing that. And, and again, it can really apply to um, grief no matter what the source of the grief. Um, other things that you can do in school settings, and and um, I, I think uh, some of the resources really offer, especially the books that are listed there, offer a lot of resources for educators. Um, um, but just teaching basic resilience skills, you know, even kids who don't um, aren't grieving at the moment, every child can benefit from resilience skills that they can use now, and will certainly come into play later in life when they deal with challenges or, or adversity of any kind. So again, that goes back to maybe some relaxation. Um, I know mindfulness is something that um, is certainly being done here in some schools in Allegheny County um, and, and can be a helpful resource for that. So I think there are a lot of things that can be adapted to a school setting. Okay, great. I think that that um, I think that covered all the questions that came in. Um, so at this time, I'm gonna thank everybody for their questions and thank you so much, Eric and Cindy, for such a great webinar. Um, I want to remind everybody because I know that a lot of people were um, chiming in about getting the slides and getting resources. So again, um, we will be sending out a uh, email tomorrow. I will have a link to the webinar recording. Um, and with the link, once you get to the page, the, there will be um, the compiled resources list along with um, a PDF version of the slides that we hear today. So everybody will be able to access a recording, the resources, and the slides.
Um, I just want to go over to that you will be getting an email after the webinar um, with our evaluation. Um, our evaluators are pleased to collect feedback from all participants. Completion of this evaluation is critical to continue to provide quality education and materials. Your participation is appreciated and the evaluation should take no more than two minutes of your time. Um, I also want to remind everybody that your certificates will be available in your My IRETA profile. Um, it can take up to 48 hours for them to appear because our systems have to cross-check and make sure that you were um, had the right amount of attendance on the webinar today. So once the uh, attendance is cross-checked and you request your certificate, it will appear in your My IRETA profile. So please be patient with us. Um, we try to do it as fast as we can but just know that it can take up to 48 hours. Um, again, I just want to thank everybody for uh, everybody who joined today. We had a great participation. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to in, um, email us at info at IRETA.org, and we will get back to you. Um, so that's it. Thank you, everybody. This was so wonderful. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, Jeff.